So just a few thoughts before I introduce the panel. Um, clearly, devolution continues to be a key item on this government's agenda, and we saw three new deals announced in the budget in March, in Greater Lincolnshire, in the west of England, and in East Anglia. And devolution is clearly often talked about in terms of its ability to achieve economic growth, um, boost productivity, close the gap between the north and south. Um, but there's an increasing interest in the role of devolution in improving public services. And we had a speech by Oliver Letwin here in January at the Institute, emphasising that devolution is also about helping local places to join up um, public services. And this is also something that many other commentators are interested in. So what we want to do today is, in um, three areas that already have devolution deals, to explore what's actually happening on the ground as we move into implementation in joining up public services locally. And our panel today will draw on their experiences and explore kind of three key questions. Um, what approach are areas taking to dealing with um, reforming public services? What opportunities does devolution offer for joining up public services? And what challenges are they facing as they start to implement um, what's in the devolution deals agreement? And we hope that these um, discussions are also going to provide some lessons for other areas who are less far along in the devolution deals process. Um, but enough from me, I'm going to move on to introduce our panel. Um, and there are indeed people working in devolution who are not called Rachel or Andrew, but today we have a fantastic panel of two Rachels and two Andrews to keep me on my toes as chair. So first of all on my left is Rachel Pikett, who is currently policy advisor to the Greater Manchester Public Service Reform Team and works across a number of public service issues. And before this, Rachel worked as a senior policy analyst at the NAO, and she's also worked for the Audit Commission. Um, next to Rachel is Andy Gates, who's head of policy at the Sheffield City Region Local Enterprise Partnership and the Combined Authority, where he leads a team covering a range of topics from housing to business support. And prior to this, Andrew was based in Biz, where his work focused on skills policy, and I think he's going to talk to us today about employment and skills issues particularly. And he's also worked for the GLA and the London Borough of Lewisham. Um, next to Andy is Rachel Jones, who's a Chief Superintendent with West Midlands Police, and previously a local policing commander for the north of Birmingham, and the fourth lead for the Trouble Families programme. And Rachel now has the dual role of Intervention and Prevention Lead for West Midlands Police, as well as being Programme Director of Public Service Reform for the West Midlands Combined Authority. And last but not least is Andrew Campbell, currently Associate Director of the LGA. Um, and prior to that, Andrew's worked in a number of Whitehall departments, including CLG, where he was Director of Local Government Policy and Director of Strategy. And he's also worked in the Cabinet Office and at the European Commission. So delighted to have such an esteemed um, selection of panel members here today who can talk about um, areas across the country who are grappling with the issues of how to join up public services through devolution deals. So I'm going to hand over first of all to Rachel um, and I'm going to be strict with time and ask each of you to speak for about eight minutes so that we can have plenty of time for discussion. So Rachel, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, with eight minutes I'm going to try and say four things, um, so hopefully not go over time. Uh, so I'm going to say a couple of things on the, um, the long journey that it's taken to, to get to devolution. Um, Great Manchester had its first deal in November 2014, um, but that wasn't the starting point. Um, then I'm going to say a couple of things about what's helped us navigate that journey. Um, a couple of things on the difficulty of implementation and joining up on the ground and then I'll finish with a, a point or two on um, our approach to working with government. Uh, so firstly then the, the, the long journey to, to devolution. Um, AGMA, the Association of Greater Manchester Authorities, was um, established in, in 1986. Um, so while devolution felt uh, to some to kind of jump out of nowhere, um, it's been a, a long journey for people who've been working on it um, in Greater Manchester since the establishment of, of, of AGMA in, in 1986. Um, after many years of, um, of, of hard work, um, we got to a position in 2009 where the Manchester Economic, um, Independent Economic Review was published and that was um, a seminal document for people in Greater Manchester and, and is still something that kind of underpins our, our strategy now. Um, which can be made the case for, for Greater Manchester as a functional economic area, um, but also highlighted that as well as kind of the economic development and investment um, decisions we, we could take together, um, the public service reform changes that we also needed uh, to make to ensure that um, the people of Greater Manchester had the opportunities uh, to take advantage of um, the, the opportunities that, that, that economic development brings. 
Um, after the MIR was published in 2009, um, there's been a period of, of, of working with government, of piloting new programmes, testing new approaches, which kind of got us to a point in uh, 2014 where the first devolution deal was, was signed. Um, we've now had five deals with government um, since that point um, and an increasing number um, of policy areas are being covered. Um, so it's not a kind of a, a one-time event, it's something that's a continuous um, programme for us. Um, so in terms of some of the things that have helped us navigate that journey, um, I think the, the importance of kind of collaborative and strong um, regional leadership um, has been really important for us. Um, so we've had, we've had leaders such as Richard, Richard Lease and Howard Bernstein who've, who've been in position for 20 years or more now. That kind of, that strong stable leadership gives you um, a really helpful starting point in able to weather some of the difficult times as well as the easy times. Um, there's also been a kind of a political pragmatism. There's been a lot of cross-party working in Greater Manchester, um, a lot of time spent on ensuring um, that we reach positions where there can be cross-party consensus and that helps us then in how we um, can implement change. Um, there's also been an important kind of focus on building strong relationships with government, not kind of sitting down and having set-piece conversations, but spending time um, building trust, building relationships, ensuring that there's a kind of a trust that uh, we will together uh, learn from what we're doing and think about how we develop further. Um, and I guess the, the main thing that's helped Greater Manchester, well not the main thing, one of the things that's helped Greater Manchester navigate uh, the difficult journey um, that other areas do sometimes seem to struggle with is having a, that clear geography. Um, so we have a lot of people who come up and kind of ask questions about how we've got where we got to um, and don't yet quite yet know what, the, what their geography is, who their partners are. And I think that, that kind of clarity of starting point um, is, is really helpful. Um, but having that tied to a clear strategy as well, not just knowing who the people are you're talking to, but why you're talking to them um, is important. Um, in terms of implementing reform on the ground, um, I guess the benefit of a locally led approach is you've got all the right people in the same place. Um, it takes time, it takes trust um, to build relationships, to build um, new ways of working. Having people in the same building at times, at, at least in the same city, is helpful. Um, when your partners are in London, that can be a, a harder challenge to navigate sometimes. Um, so, so we found that helpful. Um, with those kind of uh, locally led initiatives, I guess there's a um, a joint understanding of the, the challenges and opportunities that you're facing. Um, it's not a kind of how do we make this national, um, how do we make a national picture um, work locally. We're very much focused on what are the local challenges um, and how do we work together to, to address those. Um, and I guess where we've been able to uh, work with government to identify flexibilities around funding, um, there's a greater capacity to then um, corral funding around the issues that matter um, on the ground. Um, and I guess one, one of the things that we're working on at the moment is an initiative around um, place-based integration pilots and one of the things we've, we found through that is um, that one of the greatest kind of pressures on public services is one another. We're referring people who don't quite meet, meet thresholds to another service, they get assessed again, um, they don't quite meet a threshold, things escalate, eventually somebody deals with them but we've referred them around the system about 7,000 times before we get there. Um, so working together to identify those sorts of patterns and intervene earlier um, has been a, a real um, kind of important focus for us. Um, so finally then, just in terms of the approach we've taken to working with government, um, I've been to a few of these sorts of events where kind of one of the points that keeps being made is we should have a starting point that's kind of the rule book that government gives us and says this is, this is what we will talk about with you, um, which feels like a slightly strange starting point to me. The whole point of devolution is that we're having a different dialogue with government, we're having a different conversation about how we could um, manage public services and if the first thing we ask them is tell us what we won't ever do, tell us what you won't devolve, that seems like a, um, a, a defeatist approach at times. Um, I think some of the things that Greater Manchester has had devolved to it are things that we were discussing in the first deal but we didn't quite get to an agreement but by the time we've got to deal five that is in the agreement so I, I would kind of urge people not, not, to, not to be defeatist and say tell us what you won't ever devolve to us because they, they might change their mind. Great, thank you very much Rachel. Andy. Thanks Joe. Um, good afternoon everyone. I guess for me the question about what does devolution mean for joining public services there's a big part of this, obviously, we should have been doing a lot of this already in any way. And what, what devolution is just an, another thing that's around at the moment. And local, local areas have always been talking about integration and alignment of services. But I think, I guess it's been hamstrung by, by an 
not an, no access really to some of the big levers and no access really to any of the big benefits. Um, and what I mean really is it, it, certainly in Sheffield City region, I think it's the same for Manchester and large parts of the north, we, even Manchester, a ter ter terrifically successful economy, still costs more to the state than it produces by, by quite a few billion. I certainly know in the Sheffield City region it's quite a few billion. And yet, there's no real, and apart from the altruism of our leaders, there's no real benefit to fixing some of this stuff because we don't get to keep any of the uh, growth from, from growing our economy in terms of business rates, and we don't get to keep any of the savings from reduced cost of, of, of public services. So you sit there and say, well, well, why would we bother? And, and of course, people bother, and lots of people spend an awful, awful, inordinate amount of time trying to do it. But when you don't have access to some of the levers or some of the benefits, then it, it becomes quite a difficult sell when you're trying to do all of the other things that local government and combined authorities and LEPs are responsible for. Um, and I think, so my point, I think, is that devolution starts to give us some of the levers, but also some of the advantages and benefits of, of really doing this. Um, I mean, the irony in all this for the Sheffield City region particularly is that we haven't gone near public service reform. If you look in our devolution deal, it's very clear. It says this is an economic deal. Um, and, of course, the irony is there, of course, you, you, cannot have, you cannot support the economy and grow the economy unless you fix some of the sort of entrenched or intractable problems of worklessness and health integration, all those issues. So we're actually, our experience in the Sheffield City region is it, it is kind of happening by the back door because... Actually, we're doing, we've got the adult education budget, so you know, the adult skills budget devolved to us by 2018 19. Um, we've got increased and, and really good close working now with the, with the DWP. Um, inevitably, that is getting us into public service reform territory, whether we like it or not. And there's some big P, P, P politics and some small P politics as well. We haven't gone near that. So, I, so for me, the sort of the, the, the genie is out of the bottle on public service and public sector reform. Um, when you add in, as which is what's what's happened, as government have pushed various formal collaborative working arrangements. So, combined authorities um, are effectively the sort of formal legal statutory basis upon which we will collaborate. So in the Sheffield City region there are nine local authorities. Our combined authority puts all those nine together in a statutory body that can spend public money, can do stuff. Um, we are now going to add a mayor to that. So we will, we will be a mayoral combined authority. And the minute, I think, the, the, certainly the London experience is that you've got a mayor in, in Ken and then Boris who had, actually, when you looked at the list of powers in the GLA Act, not that many. Um, but the influence that that mayor and the mayoralty and, and, and City Hall more broadly has exercised is huge and has gone into territory that, that you, you wouldn't have thought possible. Um, still hasn't got anything around education and 14 to 19 stuff and, and, and it's only just made the case around full localisation of business rates and you know, they, they had a tra Tony Travers running the, sort of the finance commission. So they've been, them and Manchester are probably like bashing the door down for, for other areas. Um, but we don't know in the Sheffield City region where the mayor will go. He or she will have a thing that they want to get done, and just because it's not on the list of powers. So I think the Centre for Cities just published some research which said the thing that most local people want elected mayors in the city regions to do is tackle affordable housing. If you look in our, when we publish our order in Parliament and our mayoral scheme, very little to do with affordable housing. But me as head of policy isn't going to be able to say to that mayor on May the 8th, well, you put it in your manifesto, but we can't really touch it. We will just inevitably go into that space. Um, so I just I see these deals as, as shifting from the economic to a whole broader footprint, which I think is was really good. Um, and then you know probably very quick another point would be inclusive growth is kind of starting to to, to, to gain some traction. The, the various commissions are looking at how do you attack you know actually how do you really link. Um, residents to the benefits being created and, and certainly I know London's ha has that problem. Manchester has certainly very very ac clearly acknowledged it is a problem I think we're going to have to do. So we can't just say it's the economy stupid, it's not just the economy, it's ev every single piece and the footprint of mayors I think will go into that territory. Um, in terms of working relationships we've had some 
uh, I'm look, looking at various people in the room, sort of looking at James from the Treasury at the back, and we've actually had a really positive working relationship with all sorts of officials at all sorts of levels within, within Whitehall. Um, there are, of course, some departments who are slightly re recalcitrant in terms of um, offering up stuff, but you know, I'm sure there, I think there are DWP in the room today, and actually we've got a really positive working experience over the last three or four months with DWP, and I never thought I'd say that. When I was in Vocational Education Strategy Unit in Biz, um, I remember writing a briefing for Matthew Hancock saying we could look at devolving the adult skills budget, and he wrote back with a big red line saying, never going to happen. And yet, two, three years later, we're, we're devolving the adult, adult skills budget. So, it, 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 actually, Whitehall, I think, has, has, has kind of shifted a bit. And anyone working in, in Simon Ridley's CLG uh, world, which is kind of growing, is it's fantastic. Those officials in the room, whenever we meet them, are up for this and are trying to work out how we do it. Um, so I'm ex extraordinarily positive. I think it inevitably leads us into better public service and public sector reform. Um, it is really hard, so we're not going to crack it. Um, and lots of this sort of stuff we should have been doing for years and probably haven't collaborated formally on it. Um, but if we can keep some of the benefits of it, um, then it stands a pretty good chance of being locked in. Great, thank you. And really interesting issues around the mayor, because I think the other issue that that poll raised was health. So health and housing, which again, are often not in the deals that we've seen so far, but whether that territory shifts as mayors come in. Great, thank you. Rachel. Okay, um, a little bit of context for the West Midlands, excuse my voice. Um, uh, Rachel talked about 20 years of sort of foundational work in Greater Manchester. We're, we're probably pushing about 20 minutes of it in West Midlands at the moment. Um, <laughs> you talked about the deficit um, between what we spend on public services and what we generate in revenue. Ours is in the region of about 3.9 billion. We have a very fragmented, fragmented but over centralised public service provision. Um, and invariably, we're, we're concentrating and focusing because of stresses on budgets and things on the acute end, the crisis intervention point, which is more costly and less effective, and we need to move and get more upstream. Um, I think it was the Manchester Independent Economic Review, uh, 2009 or something like that, emphasised the importance, if you are going to generate and sustain long-term economic growth, you really have got to invest in skills. And investing in skills is about investing in early years, building not only the skill base for the economy, but people that are emotionally and socially resilient to stay and maintain employment, um, to service economic growth. Um, and that's where I come from, the public service reform mantra, as it were. Um, so uh, where to start is a bit of a big beast, as you alluded to, Andrew. And uh, so I guess we, we started on hanging it on some principles, um, principles probably self-evident, really, around prevention and outcome focus, which I've just alluded to, about empowerment. There are a lot of, we're not only empowering our professionals to design and redesign services in a more integrated way, but also empowering the citizen and making sure we optimise their contribution um, to public service provision and to being socially and emotionally resilient themselves. And cost effectiveness. We have got to make better use of the public pound. Uh, and that in turn will need a greater sophistication around us understanding economic modelling. So when we invest in preventative <coughs> services, where are those benefits realised and how do we share those across the public service piece? Uh, which has always been a bit problematic. Um, so our approach, um, our approach is kind of twofold. It's described as a synthesis of a big ticket programme around troubled individuals. And I know Joe Chook is in the audience. Um, uh, I've led for troubled families and I'm absolutely bought into uh, the principles that sit behind the troubled families programme. Um, how it's translated in practice is variable across the, across the, um, across the country. Um, but essentially, that is our big ticket programme under which we have currently, initially, three priority areas that we're focusing on. And that's mental health, um, uh, employment and skills, and offending slash devolution of youth justice. Um, we also describe it as an experimental approach. Um, an experimental approach across a, a range of services, a range of, of cohorts or groups, um, as well as geographies, about testing ideas and new ideas, measuring the impact and scaling up to a combined authority level what works. Inextricably interconnected across those areas, um, really this is about our foundation to, to generating a whole system approach. Um, how it'll transpire, we'll, we'll, we'll see in due course. Uh, but we have a number of key enablers, or we have identified a number of key enablers. Integration, um, obviously we're looking at much more integrated service delivery. We've operated in silos, and our delivery, our service is very, very much around the organisation and not the citizen journey. Um, it's around whole person, whole family, very much um, complementing the sort of integrated approach and, and indeed the troubled families uh, mantra, really. Um, we, we're in the design process of um, developing a filter. 
Um, and that really is going to be a mechanism to undertake some cost-benefit analysis as well as looking at just the financial, the sort of social value aspect as well um, to give the combined authority confidence in terms of what they're going to invest. So we identify a new approach, a new way of doing things, put it through the filter, does it give good bang for its buck? Um, and uh, oh, is that the right way around? Yeah, I think so. Um, so we're developing the filter uh, process at the moment, but it's independent. It's going to be an independent and robust evaluation. Data integration and digitalization is absolutely key. Um, having operated in the public service landscape for a while now, it has always been incredibly frustrating about how actually the police themselves haven't done very well in, in sort of mining our own data, never mind mining and sharing data effectively across public service provision. Also, digitalization is an enabler to more effective service delivery. People, culture and leadership, that's not only enabling citizens, empowering citizens, it's also our own public services, our own public servants. We need to invest the skills in them um, to ensure that they can operate in a more integrated partnership landscape um, and capitalise opportunities around digitalisation and other such stuff. So our outcomes for public service reform are focusing on improving life chances, so getting much many more people into the world of work and making them less dependent on the state, um, but also um, sharing and developing resources which we feel um, is a prerequisite to that. So if I just touch briefly on our four key areas, troubled individuals, we're doing a call for evidence, scoping the landscape at the moment and trying to find some good initiatives which we will put the filter, through the filter and determine whether or not to scale up. Mental health, there's a mental health commission um, being led by Sir Norman Lamb, a uh, number of key lines of inquiries around employment, housing, early intervention principles, um, criminal justice and zero suicide ambition. Um, what I would emphasise here is that it is a review, it's a whole systems review. It is not a review of mental health services. So we are focusing very much on how to keep people well um, and hopefully a number of practical recommendations will fall out of that about keeping people well rather than sort of spreading the cost of, of trying to get people be better, which is so, le so much less effective. Employment and skills, I think Andrew's uh, alluded to and touched on, on that um, again, mirrored in the West Midlands area and some challenges around it as well. Um, and offending and devolution of youth justice, Again, in parallel with the troubled individuals, there are a number of initiatives that we're currently sponsoring around women offending and focusing on rehabilitative and therapeutic services rather than putting through the criminal justice system. So there's some sort of policy devolution there about sort of freeing the shackles in, term, in, in putting people through the courts. Um, <coughs> but also youth justices um, is, a, is a very challenging landscape at the moment. Um, you know, a lot of youth offending teams are, feel like they're victims of their own success almost in terms of the cut in funding. Certainly in West Midlands, we've reduced reoffending rates by 70%. Um, and, and in terms of that cohort, um, and yet what we have still left is a very challenging cohort and a very difficult cohort to deal with. Uh, we're less effective at doing that, and there's some still some really serious inequalities around BME entering our CJ. Uh, uh, um, CJ services and the over-representation of BME and also those that are looked after care um, children. Um, so there's some real challenges and we're, over the course of a year we're going to scope out some options around how we deliver youth justice going forward. Those are the key areas. Um, in terms of um, the opportunities the deals offer, I think funding is a big one. Um, a lot of evidence, we're, we're looking at maybe predicating some of our work on adverse childhood experiences. There's a growing body of research that tells you, um, and you can either have adverse childhood experiences in your environment or you can experience them directly. Anything from neglect to substance abuse, parent incarcerated, domestic abuse. And if you build up four or more, um, then the, the probability of you becoming either a victim of violent crime, an offender of violent crime, or just generally vulnerable is huge in comparison to those that aren't exposed to these. If we identified them early on, focus on early intervention and prevention, we have a, a wealth of opportunity to reduce the demand on state and fundamentally to reduce the harrows those individuals will experience later on in life. But if the evidence shows that in terms of budgets, there are lots of opportunities for certain public services to intervene early, but the financial incentive isn't there for them to do it because they don't realise a return on that investment. There's a huge return on investment if you look across the whole of the public landscape, but not on necessarily the organisation that invests in that early intervention and prevention. So huge liberty and freedom there um, to break through some of those funding streams and also to incentivise transformation and give us some capacity to invest in prevention whilst we're also still dealing with the acute crisis end. Um, policy intervention, I talked about the sort of women offending and some um, opportunities around uh, perhaps um, uh, young men um, not necessarily being overly prescribed about dealing them in the adult courts when actually some evidence suggests that uh, in terms of maturation of the, of the brain and what have you, they're better dealt with in a sort of youth court environment. 
Um, so policy devolution offers plenty of opportunities there. And fundamentally, and I come back to my point around data integration, data devolution really is, I think, critical um, to delivering on public services reform. Have I got a few minutes just to touch on challenges? Um, yeah, just touch okay. on challenges. Okay, just right. a few challenges. Um, the name, there's a bit of deliberation around whether public service reform was the right name. Um, Buy-in, and I come back to my point, um, a lot of people think devolution is about the economy. Uh, and about driving um, economic prosperity is great big sexy financial pots of money when it comes to transport, economy, infrastructure, um, or public service reform, you've actually got to stump up some money to invest in this, and, and there's a few scratchy head moments there. So we've had some difficulty getting some traction on the public service reform agenda. Um, also, um, I think, uh, as I talked about us having sort of 20 minutes into this world, um, there's almost a race for Devo 2. Now we're trying to instill a discipline around what we adopt and what we do had a bit of an evidence base to it as well. Um, if you're racing for Devo 2, don't get me wrong, we're not seeking not to be ambitious. We want to be ambitious about this thing, but we want to make sure that it's thought through and it goes going to realise our ambitions for public service reform. So there's some challenges around timescales there. And uh, I, think, I think that's probably my bit. Great, that's really helpful. And really interesting to hear about the kind of focus on prevention and thinking about system-wide changes as well as experimenting and thinking about the evaluation and data issues that come along with that. So, last but not least, Andrew. So, I'm going to say what I say based on partly on my experience as a civil servant. As Joe said, when I led on local government policy, uh, I was the lead official responsible for something called Total Place. And some of what I'm going to say is based on my experience of the devolution scene as I, as I interpret it now. Um, so, Total Place convinced me there must be a better way of delivering public services than we've currently got at the moment. And if I start with a bit of a frustration, it sort of echoes something Andy said, really. We should have been making faster progress than we have on the public services agenda. So if you'd asked me six years ago, where are the big gains in going to be in the way that government, collectively, uh, central and at the local level, does things differently, I've said public services. But actually, it hasn't worked out like that. The big gains have been in the economic growth agenda. And I'll come back and say a little bit more about that, picking up some of the challenges that Rachel was outlining at the end. So that's not to say there hasn't been any progress at all, because um, uh, Total Place led to community budgets, which had a focus on high-cost communities, and out of that and around the same time came Troubled Families, which was a flagship programme for the then coalition government. But if you're thinking about it in a Devo context, the economic and who would have thought this in 2007, 2008, sort of than around the time of the crash, has outstripped the public service agenda in, in the willingness to do things differently and devolve. Point two, um, actually, I think, again, ever since sort of Total Place, the LGA's rewiring of public services, under the coalition government there was an independent panel report called Bolder, Braver, Better, all saying pretty much the same thing. So we know, at least we think we know, what needs to happen to do things differently. And in the word of the, the independent panel for, report, there are four main themes. So you put people first, regardless of the organisation which is delivering services for them. Uh, I think it might have been Andy who said it, but you know we're, we're very good at shuffling people around from one organisation to another. Um, actually, if you, my view is that if you put organisational, the, the redesign of existing organisations at the heart of your devolution or doing things differently, you're not going to make much progress. You've got to think of it as troubled families did, I think, from the family's point of view or the individual's point of view, and use digital techniques and whatever to help you do that. But if you think about, if your first thought is, what does this agenda mean for my organisation, you're never quite going to crack it in the way that I think um, the scale of the challenge demands. Um, I also was responsible once upon a time for something called local area agreements, which I loved. Um, but looking back, it was probably a bit over heavy on process targets. Um, so, so again, thinking about it, so if you're really trying to meet people's needs, of course you need some performance management and you need some discipline around that. But it mustn't become an industry in, it, in, it, in itself. And as Rachel said, so part of this is about what can people and the, their communities do for themselves. So again, if you go back 10 years or so ago, the model was a consumerist model, 
giving people choice in public services as though they were cons cons their role was to consume public services. It all feels a bit different now. Public top quality public services need to be provided for those who most need it. But what can people do for themselves and what can their families help them achieve for themselves? And what can their neighbours do? So thinking about what is the true level of demand and nature of demand, I think is, again, I think fairly common ground now across, it's not just a local government viewpoint, I think that's a sort of a common, common viewpoint across people who provide public services. And last but not least, whole sense of, so, so we need to get rid of duplication between services. Um, I remember someone saying around the total time of total place, the best thing we could do for any uh, family would be give them a diary manager to help them plan all the visits they're getting from the various agencies who want to help them. And there's an element of truth in, in that. So reducing duplication and overlap between agencies. Again, I think those are the sort of the co core points of the future that people see in their head as the way of doing things. Now, what strikes me about the Devo deals to date is actually there are some pretty common themes emerging. If you look at the deals, um, I think there are five, five key areas that are going to make the running in this public service reform uh, uh, agenda. Some of them have been mentioned already, probably most, all of them probably have been mentioned already. So the first is health and social care integration. So that's where probably the biggest prize is fi financially. Um, it's not plain sailing. So some areas are saying, we know we want to do something in this space, but we're a bit nervous about either what we understand and hear, so I'm thinking from local government perspective here, what we understand and hear about the nature of the performance of some of the hospitals in our area, or we're a bit nervous about what we hear about the scale of the financial challenge facing our area's health economy. Um, so the heart wants to do it, but the head is just holding people back, and I think that's a sensible thing to do. So those areas which have got something on health and social care in their devolution agreement often say, we'd like to do a bit more work on this, which I think is entirely sensible. London, I think, is really interesting. So there's no one that's on the panel from London here, so I can sort of get this wrong a bit, probably. Um, but there are various pilots underway, one of which is really looking at estates, so joining up the health estate with the sort of local government estate. Um, one of which is absolutely about integrating physical, sort of traditional health, if I can put it that way, and mental health uh, uh, with an emphasis on, with, with alongside social care. So it's not just that bit of health and social care, it's mental health included in, in there. Um, Hackney are running a pilot aiming at full integration of health and social care with a particular focus on prevention. Um, and dum, 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 there's one more which escapes me a bit. But I think the key thing there is, so Manchester's got a lot of the headlines in terms of the integration of health and social care in Greater Manchester. I think it's also just worthwhile keeping an eye on what happens in these pilots in London, and I expect there'll be pilots elsewhere just to test out the ground a bit on what's possible. Area two, children's services. So Manchester and Liverpool uh, leading the way on that. Uh, it was just Manchester, but in Liverpool's Devo two, they also explored that space. So that for me is signaling this is an area that's ripe for more sort of interest and more deals to be done. Life chances and troubled individuals, number three. Rachel's mentioned that. Uh, both Rachel's have mentioned it. That feels to me an absolute classic of an area that's, um, where progress can be made. Uh, number four is work. So um, Andy's mentioned that already in the Sheffield context. Lots of the Devo deals now include something around getting those furthest from the labour market, helping them back into work. And the fifth is more recent, but uh, so Rachel mentioned it in terms of offender management, criminal justice system. The Lincolnshire deal, which was announced at budget, had quite a substantial bit of text on that. So from a bit from nowhere, just as in the very early days of deals, there wasn't much on housing, there increasingly there is. In the very early deals, there wasn't much on criminal justice, there now is. So it's a moving, a moving feast. So I think the, the government's signalling 
but that's ripe for innovative, interesting proposals in the devolution space as well. So those are the five themes as they currently stand. I'm sure there'll be more uh, added over the next year. Um, I'll wrap up uh, quickly. So challenges. Why, so if we know what we're about, and if there's this broad agreement, and we've been at it for a while, why are things going slower than we might have expected? So some of it, I think, is our old friend around silo-based delivery. So as a Whitehall veteran, I love Whitehall, but we are comfortable in our silo delivery departments and some of it is, I think, linked to accounting officer responsibilities. Some of it is linked to who you know, ministers are accountable for delivering X to the sort of prime minister and so on. So we still instinctively think in terms of our own patch of turf rather than place or, or, or across departmental boundaries. It's got better in my career as a civil servant, but it's not where we need to be to deliver this sort of scale uh, change. Um, point two, systemic constraints. So actually I think it's easier to devolve packets of funding linked to skills or whatever than public sector reform, where it is a public, you know, it's systemic reform, it is systemic change, and that lends itself less well to devolving a bit here, a bit of a chain here and a, a bit of something over there. Uh, you've got to think about the whole system, which I think, therefore, it's more complex, and therefore, I think it's been a bit slower. Uh, money, number three. So actually, it's not about less money in the system. I think necessity is the mother of invention. But it picks up, it makes people a bit more cautious about taking risks with the money that they've got. Um, and also, money still tends to come down that delivery silo, so you've got money to do X or linked to X. It makes it more difficult to pull funding um, ac across the piece. And finally, so this is something that's sort of not, not a party political point in any way at all, but I remember Liam Byrne, when he was Chief Secretary of the Treasury, saying, you know, um, we've made loads of efficiencies within organisations. The real trick now is making efficiencies between organisations. And it feels to me for the first time as though we've got a structure in combined authorities that makes that a lot easier to happen because of their nature of bringing together, in many places, local government, the health service, the police crime commissioner, in a way that people will be thinking about the combined authority, that collective, not just their role within it as local government or whatever, and Andy was absolutely right. When the mayors come on the scene, they're not going to feel constrained. So in addition to that structural change of the combined authority, you're going to have powerful political figures locally in their own right who can help make things happen. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to pick up two issues before opening it up to the floor. Um, the first is really about the role of Whitehall as we move into implementation. So obviously they've had a very clear role in the sort of deal-making process, but now that you're actually grappling with trying to turn that into reality um, in the places that you're from, like what, what role do you think Whitehall should play in supporting areas to implement? Rachel, can I start with you? Um, I think there's something about um, playing a role in supporting, um, tackling some of those barriers that have been mentioned. Um, so there's a, an age-old barrier around information sharing. Um, so we, on the ground, in places, need to find ways um, to share relevant information with one another. Um, but some of the information that we need to be able to share is, um, is essentially held as well. Um, so there's a, something about being a willing partner in, in, that, um, in that discussion when it's needed. And I think there's also something around um, regulation and inspection. Um, the national accountability frameworks and national performance frameworks can drive individual partners down different routes because um, they're trying to um, respond to um, uh, individual um, sector performance regimes mm -hmm. which aren't necessarily compatible with um, the priorities that a place might have set. Um, so there's something I think in, in government being a, um, an advocate for differentiation of, of um, uh, recognising place as opposed to sector um, in the way that um, they encourage um, regulators and inspectors to, to work with places. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Andy? I think that point about accountability, uh, the, the NAO recently did a report and it was slightly coruscating about devolution. Uh, and for me, it entirely missed the point because it was looking at devolution from the perspective of depart departments 
being accountable to their respective public accounts committee. And if you've devolved it, it's not, not your job anymore, Secretary of State. You've let it go. Um, it's, it's up to local authority assurance and accountability. And they exist. There are plenty of overview scru scrutiny committees in local authorities, local government. And our combined authority has all those. So there's just, I think it's just, it's going to take time for that to, to filter through. Um, but I, most of this is a shared endeavor, really. And I think probably some departments feel as though devolution is being done to them. Actually, some places feel as though devolution is being done to them. Um, so once, you know, once the dust has settled on all of the politics of it, um, far more mature. When I, used, I started my work, my, my career at Doncaster Council on like a local government grad scheme, and our own trying to get a conversation with your job centre plus relationship manager was 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 extraordinarily difficult. Um, they aren't the right person to be having a conversation with in terms of aligning local employment skills. So being able to have pick up the phone and have a conversation with a, with a, a civil servant is hugely valuable, and I, and I think it's really changed in the last eighteen months. To be honest, mm -hmm. great. Let's keep doing it. Rachel? Um, I'd concur with Rachel about the data uh, bit and the information sharing. I mean, the, the, the Cabinet Officer, there's a team, better use of data, that are working currently on trying to do that. I think in probably an appropriately cautious as manner, um, but I think we can build on that aspiration. Um, I would also say I think there's opportunities around understanding where we place, store, hold data to deliver services in a place-based premise as well. I think we need to, need to do some thinking through at that. We've got lots of different data controllers um, sort of uh, bashing heads around what we can and can't share at the moment when we've got a million and one information sharing protocols. It feels that that, that landscape needs to be simplified a little bit um, with due caution around privacy concerns and so on and so forth. Um, uh, I guess being in these early phases, um, it feels like uh, there's sometimes a disconnect in Whitehall. Um, so we've agreed an implementation it, the doing of the we've agreed what we the DVO, DVO agreement, but what we haven't worked through is some of the challenges of Whitehall departments coming up against each other, which is frustrating implementation in, in parts. Uh, and some of that, actually, I, I wonder if there's um, yes, we, we're in early phases, we've got to build and develop those relationships, but I do question whether or not there's the capacity sometimes um, within Whitehall to service that as well. And I think if we're going down the DVO route, then that capacity needs to be built. Great, thank you. Andrew. So I think, Joe, your question is around Whitehall helping local areas uh, uh, support implementation. So I start in a slightly different place, which is it's for local government and other members of the combined authority to make sure their implementation plans are really well thought through and they're confident that they'll deliver. So it's for us uh, to do it properly. Then I think sort of the, White, uh, the Whitehall role then is uh, challenge uh, constructively, but that's a, it's a good thing, where Whitehall thinks some areas are not really doing as they should. Um, and I think the other thing is, and helping areas identify opportunities. So it's not so much in the nitty gritty of sort of day to day <laughs> performance management, which I think should be left to local level, it's brackets, except escalate where there are concerns. But there's also something about, um, have you thought that if you did this um, why could follow so it's less acting on checking up but more helping exploit opportunities mm -hmm. that might be around I think would be uh, good I'm absolutely convinced of the need to see this as a co-production type exercise so again as my civil service background I've seen things that sort of set off and as information to Whitehall dries up Whitehall loses interest so we absolutely need to keep everyone engaged in this but it's also keeping them engaged in a way to make things happen, not just check up that others are doing things. Yeah. And actually, that was the second theme I just wanted to pick up on before opening up, um, is, is that engagement point. So obviously, as we're in the sort of deal-making, that necessarily involves a limited group of people, perhaps behind closed doors, to get deals done. But as we've moved into implementation, how are you thinking about involving kind of citizens in the places that you're from and also frontline staff in terms of actually designing public service reform? Shall we start the other end, start with Rachel this time? We have what is a formative stakeholder engagement plan at the moment. Um, I, I, it really is early days. Um, we've almost got to the stage where we're moving from, we will be shortly moving from shadow combined, or, or we're still in shadow combined authority format. Um, 
uh, we're thinking of it in terms of the public service reform, uh, we've actually got to start with those in the public services themselves at the moment, um, because there's very little known uh, about the combined authority per se, never mind public service reform being a key work stream. Um, so sort of tentatively making those connections and sounding out what has been our sort of approach or our manifesto that we've built around public service reform. Um, but what has helped is our methodology is around um, scoping out what's out there at the moment. Um, so we've had workshops, we've had calls for evidence and so on and so forth, and that help is, is helping the jungle drums rumbling a little bit, uh, but also is bringing to the fore some of the good ideas that will ultimately inform um, some of those initiatives that will drive forward under the public service reform agenda. Thanks. Thank you. Andy? I don't know. It's difficult. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> like our public, I'm not entirely sure they remotely care about public service reform, uh, if, you, if you sat each one down and talked them through it, they would. Um, but we, so we've got a huge job, I mean, taking it up a level to, to when we need our um, elected mayor to have a mandate. And we got 14% turnout for PCCs. Um, if our mayor's got a 14% mandate turnout, he or she is not really going to be able to come and lobby government asking for more or, or do stuff. So, and it's certainly, we know that departments are kind of keen, certainly under the Treasury are very keen and, and, and CLG are very keen that we do some proactive comms. Um, and we've got a real challenge because why should we be spending our limited resources, our hard won resources as well, on promoting something? Um, and I suspect it with the quality of mayoral or candidates that come forward. Um, that make it an interesting <coughs> debate and people have heard about it and media and stuff. So, I mean, we have got a job to do and we're going to get some surveying done of our residents to understand what do they know, what do they care about and how can we best communicate with them. Um, but I'm not sure we'll crack it first time around anyway. Rachel, what's your perspective on Manchester? Um, I think where we've got whole system reform, so the health and social care um, devolution arrangements are a whole system um, uh, reform program um, and at a significant scale um, you have to communicate um, with the public um, and there is a program uh, of communication in, in place uh, and there are um, opportunities being identified for co-production um, and if part of what we're trying to achieve is um, thinking about what bits of those services might be better delivered by communities, where, where can we empower communities, that has to be a dialogue, we can't just leave it to them and they say we're not doing things anymore so work it out for yourself. Um, so th there has to be um, uh, that um, opportunity to, to, to work together. I think where it's more um, piece, piecemeal reform, um, so uh, as been described by others, you know, there have been um, devolution of particular programmes or particular bits of budget, it's harder to communicate that because it's it, you're not talking about a whole system you're not talking about something that's going to impact on an entire community or an entire place it's something that um, impacts on a set of families or a set of individuals who meet a set of criteria so, so communicating around that um, is a I guess a harder job in some respects um, so do all everything and then we can communicate, out, communicate about it yeah so it feels like as we go towards the mayoral elections um, next year there's quite work to do in terms of how to get people engaged in actually designing and delivering services, get citizen engagement and frontline staff and, and to kind of map that gap of what people say they're interested in, in terms of health and housing and what the deals are, are doing. So something that others may want to pick up in questions as well. But I'm going to open it up to the floor. Lots and lots of hands going up. Um, please can you say your name and organisation um, before you ask your question and try and keep questions brief because there are lots of them. So first of all, um, David, and then at the back there, um, just there behind you. Thank you. And then at the back, and then one here, and we'll take them in groups of three. Uh, David Walker, uh, Guardian Public. I'm tempted to serve, given the number of people in this room who once worked for the uh, late Great Audit Commission, that the quality of this debate would be somewhat raised were that organisation still in existence, but pass that by. Um, haven't you, thank you very much for the contributions, but haven't you slightly dodged the question of agency? If and as devolution proceeds, who is it that will organise, push, lead a process of public sector reformation? Mayors in this country, as in most jurisdictions, don't often come out as administrative reformers. They may be effective political leaders for area, but they don't usually have much by way of knowledge of public management. 
On the other side, some public managers do have small p political qualities, but most public managers shy away from the kind of political work that public service reformation of the kind you're discussing would require. Who then in devolution might be the pivot, the leader of the kind of public services reform which we are agreed uh, could be done? I'm actually going to take the questions in a group of three and then get you to respond. So there was one just right at the back there. Uh, hi, Maeve from Crisis, the charity for homeless people. Um, and it's basically a question about how we ensure that devolution avoids what's called the blame game and actually drives innovation. And you see it happening to an extent. It's uh, if you look at Northern Ireland and Scotland where we have forms of devolution. And there's a real debate there about, well, we can only do so much because we don't have the budget. I think we really want to avoid that. So when we hand over the budget, do we hand over accountability as well? Um, really interesting, we're speaking to somebody from Canada and they devolved over uh, homelessness accountability to the mayor there. And the mayor looked at that service and thought, well, actually, let's change the focus of the outcomes about addressing homelessness. So shift our acute services to thinking about this as a, an emergency response. And actually, they redesigned the entire services. They were able to rehouse people in two or three days like they would if there was, if there was a fire or another need for an emergency response in that area. So when you hand over the accountability, you can hand over the budget as well. Do you think that what are the pros and cons of effectively handing over full accountability? Great, and the final one in this group here, please. Thanks. I'm uh, Nick Sharman. I'm a councillor in Hackney, so uh, particularly interested in uh, the uh, experiment going on. And I, I really want to pick up on the issue of accountability, uh, because I think we've heard a lot of interesting, basically management-led uh, thinking about how better to integrate management systems. But actually, this will only work, as David Walker has implied, if there is a full integration of political and management leadership here. And I, I worry that there is an enormous gap uh, opening up uh, in this new system between uh, the, even a local councillor, let alone a local community, in this process. Uh, and it seems to me there are two challenges here. First of all, the formal uh, form of accountability at local level. And Andrew, you talked about um, scrutiny commissions. Scrutiny commissions, in my view, are being undermined by two factors to the point of almost disappearance. One is budget cuts are preeminently hitting uh, those uh, scrutiny commissions. And secondly, the, uh, the concentration of power in mayors actually removes the ability to have an effective uh, scrutiny function. The uh, councillors become steadily disempowered. So there's an enormous gap opening up, and I think a real danger that mayors are going to be, if you like, local, uh, the, 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 the local administrators for Whitehall detached from their uh, base. So that's a sort of democratic uh, accountability. There's a formal uh, challenge to me, and it comes up in the Hackney case, Andrew, where we've brought the uh, local authority and the uh, health service together, as you say, the health service absolutely does not want any form of local involvement uh, in that. So we've now got a body, a good body of people coming up with some interesting management stuff, no relationship with the local community whatsoever, and a real resistance. One final pitch I'd like to make is for some form of public accounts committee at local level that genuinely brings in uh, the range of services that we're now trying to integrate. Unless we have something like that with real power and real influence, an enormous gap is going to open up, in my view, between the, the, the world of integrated service and the people it's supposed to service. Great, thank you. So some big questions on accountability and um, whether devolution drives innovation, particularly through budgets, and who is the key kind of pivot person at the local level to do some of this. So, Andrew, can we start with you and, and work our way down this way? Yeah, I was afraid of that. <laughs> uh, so three really good uh, sets of questions. So, my, so I'm giving a slightly off-the-cuff uh, answer, which um, reflects how I thought about things before uh, today, but sort of the nature of the questions are going to lead me to go back and ponder them further. So my starting point is the mayor has to be the, the person around whom all questions of accountability uh, revolve. Now, I don't think it's going to be a simple world. Indeed, it will, get, it will be quite messy. It will be uh, an obvious prediction. And, uh, and again, it will be different in different places. So I think we know from the polling evidence 
uh, and actually the sort of the polling evidence is actually positive in the sense more and more people now say they have an understanding of what devolution is and more and more people are saying that we want these new mayors to have significant new powers and one area they want people, sort of the mayor to have powers is around health and social care. So I think if you talk in the abstract around public sector reform, people's eyes probably glaze over. If you say, if a new mayor in his or her manifesto was saying, if you vote for me, I'm going to, uh, I think that will really resonate with people. So I think we will, the, the mayor will get into the health uh, world. But of course the NHS would say, and the emphasis is on the end bit, the national uh, health service. So. I think there's, and I, that's why I say it's going to get a bit messy. So I'm slightly again dodging David's question, I think, but the key, a key axis of delivering changed public services in places will be the effectiveness of the operation between the mayor and his or her support staff and the NHS at that local level. And in some places that will work really well, and other places probably it would be quite confrontational and out of that will come a range of different solutions and hopefully over time the best, you know, the practice of the best will be um, uh, adopted. I don't think picking up the sort of question was sort of based on Northern Ireland and Canada experience, so actually I don't think the blame game can be avoided. So I think, again, I think what we should expect to see over the next five years and, and more is actually people blaming each other for when things go wrong, because I think that's just the way the world is and human nature is but I'm optimistic that out of that will come a sense from, from the public of get your act together public servants and out of that will come a sense of again there must be a better way of doing things and that will help drive change and innovation alongside obvious examples of people who aren't blaming each other and are getting on with really good stuff uh, and if we get this right learning from it, you know, areas learning from each other about what they did and why it worked in order to sort of lead to a step change in the way we do things currently. Great. Rachel. Um, I come from the police um, and um, obviously we've gone through the PCC experience. Um, the idea or the premise of that is to make us more accountable um, as a police service. Um, to come to Andrew's point about um, it'll probably look quite different in different areas, in essence, and I think that's our experience with PCCs as well, as to whether or not it has made us more accountable, and effectively so, um, or whether or not um, certain PCCs, and I'm certainly not getting into any names or anything like that, um, have been perhaps less effective um, in delivering on that ambition, um, and some interesting decisions that have uh, led to perhaps some destabilising of some police forces. I'll leave it at that without getting into too much detail, uh, but I would imagine in that how it manifests itself in the context of a mayor and a much broader remit. Um, how do we avoid the blame game? I'm not sure we do. How do we stop people saying, well, we haven't got the money, so we can't do that? My experience um, of the somewhat challenging uh, piece about promoting public service reform and trying to get local chief executives to sign up to uh, public service reform has been that you need a very good business case. My challenge was I didn't have the resource to invest in developing that business case so I needed some resource in order to, to, to demonstrate that and we are still very um, early in our learning around uh, the impact of public service reform and the potential of public service reform in terms of economic modelling. Um, so uh, I think Clearly, we're making big decisions about public service reform. There needs to be a sound, uh, robust business case that sits behind any change. Um, and um, in these early days, sort of some of the challenges around accountability is we're dealing with, uh, so for example, when we started discussions around the devolution of justice and we ta started talking about gain share, you know, how could we apply? West Midlands, we've done really well around offender management, which has reduced costs on the courts, it's reduced costs on the CPS. You know, what's the opportunity or what's the appetite to look at how we reinvest some of those savings in the CPS and the courts? Well, you're talking about national structures vis-a-vis -vis regional structures, and you'll be looking at local structures, and aligning those will be incredibly challenging. Um, and uh, no doubt we'll work, through, uh, work, work our way through that and hopefully learn from others as well. Great, thanks. Andy? That point about innovation, I think Manchester and Birmingham are, are doing it right now. There is stuff going on in those places and in other cities around the country. So I, I think it is happening, but for me, there's, there's some critical factors on how you innovate. And if you asked a firm 
you know, how are you de developing a new product or a new process? They'd say you need some, you need some, some, some revenue or some capital, you need some freedom, you need some sort of confidence, and you, know, you're, you also need an incentive to do it. And at the moment, or you know, historically, we haven't had much cash to do it, we haven't really had an incentive to do it, we certainly haven't had any confidence to do it. So, so, so and you know, hate to sort of give that management speak answer, but you know, they, they are, I, I think they're relevant factors in how or why a place might innovate. And I think devolution gives you some of those tools in your toolbox to do it. On that hand, on maybe the issues about handing over accountability, I was talking to someone from the IFG earlier, uh, Joe, about um, postcode lottery. And you, you can end up in a postcode lottery type of environment. We've already got a postcode lottery. It's not a reason not to do it. Um, and you know, the, the, greatest, the politician with the single biggest mandate in this country is Sadiq Khan. And before that, it was Boris Johnson by, by a country mile. Um, so you know, that feels a lot like a mandate to me. And the point about the sort of the, the, the killing of local scrutiny functions via stripping resource out, you're absolutely right. I mean, it, I, I wouldn't lay that sort of thing at de the devolution agenda's door. It's a, it's a, it's a wider issue. Um, we in the Sheffield City region have got an opportunity to, desi to design an entirely new approach to um, scrutiny. Uh, I'm not, I'm not sh convinced we're in that space yet where we're thinking about what that might look like. But it might just involve using, using digital engagement channels a bit more effectively, reinvigorating some of those civic leadership discussions that go on. Sheffield's a wash, it's a very political city. It is a wash with discussion about politics. And actually, the devolution agenda has really sort of um, put a bit of a rocket up that, it, you know, invites stuff all the time to talk about. So, so this, this could be a, a sort of a re enfranchisement of that, that civic engagement. That's quite exciting, really. Absolutely. Rachel? Um, yeah, I think the. Um Devolution needs to be accompanied by um, appropriate um, governance models. Um, I don't think that because there has been the accounting officer system, that means we must always have that same system. Um, we've uh, reformed a lot of things um, over, over many years, and we can reform governance to reflect um, the way that we are now choosing to deliver public services if that's the appropriate thing to do. So I don't think that should be the thing that kind of holds us back from, from change. Um, but I absolutely take the point that we need to ensure that if we're asking um, for local accountability structures that we um, ensure that they are invested in so that they can perform that function effectively. Um, so investment in, in scrutiny arrangements, um, ensuring that they've got um, the information um, available to them to be able to conduct that, um, that job effectively, um, I think absolutely needs to be an accompanying, accompanying um, factor to um, new governance arrangements that are put in place locally. Great, thank you. I'm going to take another set of three questions. Um, there is um, one, this lady in blue here, um, one, um, that lady at the back, um, one here, and I would encourage you to come through from the room next door um, so that I can ask you to ask a question as well. Uh, Tim Bradley, Hospital Governor from Lewisham. Uh, how many years do you think it will take to really be able to judge whether what's going on with health and social care integration is something that can, you know, is working and can, can go national, perhaps? Great, thank you. And then the question here. Actually, mine's less of a question, it's more of a continuation of the previous conversation. And can um, you say, um, who my name's Sue Maddock. Um, I've been involved in place shaping and um, uh, supporting leaders within partnerships. Um, and I, I think, uh, that just to go back to the, the presentations, though, it seems to me that there were, there were two areas that uh, were not brought up. One of them was much more innovative governance, political governance. And, um, and the other was, actually, th the big problem, it seems to me, and I'm working with health and social care partnerships, and is the, firstly, what people think, who they think to talk about. Comms is a huge, huge problem. So there's all this motivation, and then there's a huge gulf about who you tell what to. And it, it, it's a both a cross, and it's back to, uh, well, particularly people who are receiving treatment, but then it's up to the politicians. And I think this widening gap that we've got between the governance level, such that transformation and public sector reform locally looks like it's driven by executives, 
uh, you know, there are lots of committees that are strategic partnership committees and other politicians. There's not enough conversation with the politicians about what's on offer. And there's a resistance as well by people who are leading strategic partnerships to do it because it's hard. It's just as hard as talking to uh, people in communities, if not more so. And I think we've got a big problem and that's where we need innovation now in the public system. Great, thank you. And then question at the back there. Thank you. Hello. I'm Emily Giorgio from Age UK. Um, I just had a, a question for the panel, really. I really welcome a lot of the comments that, that have been made. Um, I'm just thinking about how the devolution deals are allowing us to not just deal with the situation today, but also look to the future. So by 2040, one in four of us is going to be over the age of 65, and the over 80s is the largest um, growing age group. Um, often when local government talks about older people, you find the conversations going on within social care and looking at the rising demand for social care. But actually, if we're all going to be living longer, how are we going to unlock the potential of an ageing population? And how are we going to ensure quality of life? And if we've got these amazing devolution deals, I'm going to be talking about how we shape the places that we live in now and in the future. Um, how can we make sure that everybody is thinking about the demographic change and that is an increasingly diverse and ageing population? Thank Great, you. thank you. So a nice range of questions um, there covering kind of health and social care and, how, and when we're going to know whether it's really changing the system as well as engaging with politicians um, specifically and unlocking potential of an ageing population. Rachel, do you want to go first? Yeah, um, so on um, health and social care, um, the, the Greater Manchester... Um, experiment, I guess, um, has got a, a five-year window, so let's see where we are in five years. Yeah. Um, I, w I wouldn't imagine that that will give us the answer, um, but it's a very kind of definite, definite end point where we'll be able to say something. Um, in terms of um, political leadership and engagement in reform, um, I guess I, I don't see it. Um, I, I do see the political engagement, I do see the political leadership where I am, um, so uh, it, it, it's hard to comment on um, it, it not being there. Um, I, I spend a lot of time uh, with, with local politicians um, and who have very many opinions and seem very, very engaged, so um, it may be different in other places, but, but, but my experience um, is, is not that. Um, in terms of um, where we are in, um, in 2040 and the, um, the ageing population, I think um, not, not. You mentioned health and social care, and it not being that, and, and you're right, it's not. Um, but it kind of is. So, how do we ensure that um, what our health and social care um, landscape is by that point isn't what it is now? Um, will be part of the answer of um, how we prepare effectively for an aging population. So, how do we ensure that we are not thinking about um, services for older people in terms of um, hospitals or um, uh, old people's ho homes? But how do we think about um, physical environments that are um, appropriate for, for a whole range of ages, including older people? How do we ensure that we've got um, an employment landscape that um, is um, appropriate for people to work um, for longer? Um, and we'll need to think about whether that requires a different skills landscape. So people need to re retrain at some point in their life. So. There's a whole host of policy areas beyond health and social care, um, but they need to absolutely link back into how do we ensure that health and social care isn't just how do we make sure that whole, old people um, don't get to hospital and have a rubbish end of life. Great, thank you. Andy? I can't really talk to the health and social care stuff. I genuinely don't know much about it, or enough about it. But in, in terms of innovative governments, I think I would echo, echo the point. There is or sort of executive innovative government. Are our local politicians taking ownership of stuff? Actually, there are some tremendous local politicians out there. We're at Sheffield City Region Combined Authority looking enough to be chaired by Sir Steve Houghton, who under the previous Labour government, you know, chaired and led a worklessness review, which, which said all of the things we should be doing around tackling worklessness that we're still talking about. Um, and so, so we've got some really good people, people in there. Um, I, I entirely agree with Rachel's point. Around, I mean, the, the issue about um, sort of an ageing population and, and how do you... I, I entirely agree it is a challenge. I entirely agree that it's got to be someone to fix it. I'd much rather it was a, an elected mayor with a direct mandate who had the ability to coalesce public services around a political mandate as well. And I mean, there's some really interesting stuff going on in the Sheffield City region with the Department of Health on, a, on something called Testbed Pathways, which is looking about how do you put data and, and, and um, stuff alongside 
public health, public services, actually plugged into the Sheffield um, sort of GP practices. Actually, that's linked to a specialism within the Sheffield City Region tech sector, and, you and, and then teaching hospitals, which are massive in the, in, the, in the city, city region. So you think, actually, there are solutions to be generated, and what hopefully will happen out of the evolution is that places will have the confidence to become specialists at stuff. Um, that was probably one of the challenges with regional development agencies. Everyone had a strategy to be good at everything. Um, whereas local areas need to have the courage to go, this is what we're going to really sort of ace and let other areas do some cool stuff and, and, and then you share it across. Great. Thank you. Rachel. Thank you. Um, the health and social care, how long will it take? Um, interesting that you've got a five-year window and I think it's, it's really important that we do review as we go along. Um, but if we come back to the ambition around troubled families and obviously health and social care is a big part of that. That was talking about breaking this intergenerational cycle of worklessness, unemployment, ill health, and so on and so forth. So I think we've got to look across a generation to determine whether or not we are going to be truly successful um, in some of the health and social care integration ambitions. Um, in terms of local politicians and their engagement, um, it's variable across the landscape. I think in part there it is incumbent upon the combined authority to present information and data that is relevant to the local politician and their locale and geography and in turn equip them with the information that they can go out to their, to their communities with so that actually everyone is engaged and in, in brought on board in, in terms of the combined authority. Um, and, and to come back to my PCC point, I think there is some interesting developments. Higher turnout in this last lot of elections, maybe, just maybe, and maybe I'm being overly optimistic, there's more voter interest in it now. Um, and you know, hopefully that will be true of uh, mayoral regions as well. Um, then uh, on the older people um, side of things, um, coming back to our Mental Health Commission, the focus is on about keeping people well. And I think that's where we need to focus our services around elderly people. Um, what, uh, we've got a huge public service workforce out there. What they're not very well equipped at doing at the moment is spotting general signs and early signs of vulnerability, a lot of which will be within the elderly population. Um, because if you spot those early signs and you equip them and enable them to access um, low, relatively low level or localised support services, you get the, these elderly people who might otherwise turn into vulnerable individuals and very dependent on the state and not very sort of, uh, nice lives as they, as they get older. You provide them with social networks, you know, may it be at a faith community, be it just a local tea club or whatever else. And the resilience and the um, quality of life then that is generated for that individual um, is so much, more, so much better. So it's, some of it's about equipping our workforce to spot those early signs. <coughs> and then, <coughs> excuse me, we need to build the referral pathways, mechanisms to ensure that we can access those relatively low levels of support, but which are critical to reducing the demand on public services and improving the life chances of individuals. Great, thank you. Andrew? So quickly, yeah, five years, I think, is the, um, uh, is the key test. Um, so what I would expect to see happen over those next five years is Greater Manchester being the, the more all-encompassing reform <coughs> agenda and take stock after five years and see how that's gone alongside, as in London, specific pilots on particular things or, as is the case in West Midlands, taking an aspect of health such as mental health and focusing on that so it'll be quite a mixed economy. I think Sue's on to something so it's great to hear about the interest sort of amongst the politicians in Manchester and Sheffield on sort of the public sector reform agenda but if I heard your question correctly there's also a bit around communications uh, in there and I think there's uh, this for me is the sort of the Achilles heel of the devolution agenda so uh, through a variety of reports we've had the message that governance is too informal and it feels like a stitch up between political administrative elites at the national and local level. So I think there does need, this, this does need to be tackled. I'm optimistic that the mere fact of having mayoral elections and mayors will say what they want to say about the economy and public services in their place will help deal with that. But it feels to me something we ought to be investing more time and effort in rather than just accepting that where we are now is okay. Then the question about, is that just a devolution and public participation debate, or is it much more about local democracy and participation? Um, and the, uh, so age, the sort of the, your, your question from Age UK. So I know of, so I have much more confidence in 
local politicians understanding the needs of their voters and then sort of um, so if I think about the south coast sort of uh, Worth places like Worthing and sort of all the way through to Dorset uh, indeed parts of uh, East Anglia the politicians there have a much better understanding of what their people need in their place than the national average uh, does so I know some places are absolutely on the agenda of so what sort of housing are we going to need do we need to be building now for the future because that's what this place needs in a way that you wouldn't necessarily be reflected in the national um, housing debate um, you're also much more likely to think about so yes we have an elderly population in some parts of the country they'll be asset rich what contribution can they make to the economy so they're not just necessarily going to be a consumer of public services they can help the economy therefore what services do we either we as the public sector need to provide or what services might the private sector want to provide for our populations and how do we the public sector the mayor or whoever make that happen to enrich um, their lives and we haven't really touched on it today because it's slightly sort of going beyond the brief of public sector reform but if you imagine 2040 and business rate localization having been a great success um, we're all locked in at the moment to a world of cuts 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 um, but you can imagine a world where local places will have money to bring to the agenda to make things happen under devolution it's not forever going to be how can we squeeze more efficiencies out of the agenda it'll be much you know over time there'll be and how can we use the money that we have locally in a way to support partly political priorities as determined by the mayor or whoever but absolutely the priorities of the populations of our place Great, thank you. Um, we had a question here, um, one at the back there, and one here. Nehal Davison, Institute for Government. Um, given there's so much kind of experimentation going on at the moment, and going back to Andrew's point that kind of we are likely to see a kind of a mixed economy um, in five years' time, how can areas with devolution deals actually best learn from each other and also share with others kind of less far along in the process? Great, thank you. And the question here. I'm Robert Hazel, an associate of the Institute for Government and from the Constitution UCL. My question is about engaging with Whitehall, and forgive me, it's a very basic question. When you engage with Whitehall, do you engage with central government departments down here in London, or does Whitehall still have outposts in the regions? I ought to know this, but I don't. When, when the government offices for the regions were abolished in 2010, did they fade away completely? Or are there still some vestiges of regional outposts who might have rather stronger regional or local knowledge? Great. And the final question here, please. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, John Hume, teacher of politics. Uh, compared with the Scottish and Welsh models, the whole model, frankly, in a word, is uh, confusing. So I'll try and keep my question simple. Take Greater Manchester and the possibility of coordinating um, health and so NHS and social care, which seems an ultimately logical thing to do. Only one problem, what happens when they add up the sums and realise they haven't got the money and presumably are still dependent uh, upon central government? Great, thank you. Again, three very interesting questions. Um, I'm going to start with you this time, Rachel, on um, sharing learning and how areas with deals can learn from each other as well as areas less far along in the process. Um, how you in Greater Manchester engage with Whitehall and who in Whitehall you engage with and um, the finances for health and social care. Yes, fine. Um, so, um, yes, experimentation and, and how do we learn and share. Um, I, th I think incumbent on, on us when we're doing this sort of work is to um, invest where we can in the evaluation of what we're doing um, and ensure that that um, evaluation is available um, to um, colleagues around the country um, and, that is, and that is something that we do do. Um, I think th there's been some discussion around um, at times there's been you know central units that are there to help us share learning um, which everyone gets a bit um, 
sceptical about. Um, so <laughs> I think there, there is something about um, places organising that for themselves. And we have an awful lot of people come to us. We go to other places. We share our experiences. We, we share our learning. And we share our thinking. For me, that's an easier, a better way of um, um, sharing that sort of thing than trying to manage it centrally. Um, in terms of engaging with Whitehall, um, a bit of both. Um, so um, there, there's a lot of coming to London. Occasionally, London comes to us, which is very exciting. Um, but, and they do make the way up, up, up the uh, up the train line um, once in a while. Um, and there are some people who are based um, out in, in regional offices. Um, but the majority um, of, of our work has tended to be um, with um, colleagues based in, based in London. Um, and in terms of the host health and social care budget, uh, yes, a challenge. Um, and, that's, and that's kind of the, the purpose of it. Um, so the money doesn't stack up. There is a, 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 a two billion, I think, um, pound gap. Um, and that's the reason for the reform. Um, so we have got um, in Greater Manchester a £450 million transformation fund which we will use over the next five years um, to pump brine those, those bits of reform that we um, believe are going to make the difference so that we can over that time start closing the financial gap um, start taking funding out of um, the acute sector um, fun and funding crisis um, and instead funding early intervention and prevention, much like some of the work Rachel was describing um, outside of the health and social care sector. This is the same premise applies to health and social care. If you can in intervene earlier, um, you can reduce that um, reliance on, on acute um, uh, intervention. Um, but it takes um, some investment in order to, to make that shift in the system. Um, so that's, that's the experiment for the next five years and let's see where we get to. Thanks. Andy? In, in terms of um, collaboration and stuff across combined authorities or even LEPs, we're really bad at it. In fact, the only time I ever get a, together with other combined authorities or the LEPs is when I turn up to a government event or something like this. Um, and there's some good, I think there's some reasons for that. Part of the, just the pace of change, people, you know, lots, some combined authorities, some LEPs don't have a lot of people working for them. And if they do, they're really quite busy and they're all kind of working on stuff. Um, so, so that's one thing. Secondly, I think the, the government, for, for, for possibly very clear reasons, has set us up to be a bit, be a bit competitive. You know, there has been a, well, let's have a look at what Manchester are doing. We want some of that. What are Leeds doing? What are, what are the great, great West Midlands doing? Um, that, that has driven, that has definitely driven behaviour and not all negative. Um, but it does, does mean um, we haven't perhaps collaborated as much as we've competed. Um, and the irony is, of course, a lot of the devolution deals all look very similar to each other. Um, in terms of, sort of government being out in the regions, I suppose my, my political point would be uh, we've got a really good set of biz officials in Sheffield, uh, across vocational education, across enterprise and biz growth hubs. Um, Martin Donnelly <coughs> seems to think it's a good idea to move those guys into central London. Um, clearly, we think that's an awful idea for all sorts of reasons. And I think the Sheffield city region is front of every, anywhere in the country on devolution of the adult skills budget because we've got the people working on it day to day and we've got really good relationships with them. I think that's a really retrograde step, but that's, that's, that's no one here responsibility. Um, and the people who, there have always been government office people knocking about, XRDA, um, they are still all there. Um, it's, sort of, it's a pretty, pretty small merry-go-round. Some of them are really good. Some of them aren't as well connected into wild departments. Um, I don't think we've got any particular beef with coming to, 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 to the physical place where national government sits to talk to the right people. Um, it'd be just, it would be nice if we weren't cutting our nose off to spite our face in some of those um, biz decisions, but there you go. Rachel. Um, right. Uh, how do we learn from each other? I agree. Um, this sort of, we're sort of um, set up to compete almost a little bit around the Devo agree uh, agreements. Um, I think there's an opportunity for Whitehall to be a bit more transparent about some of the discussions around what's, what's being negotiated with certain regions around devolution so that we can learn from each other, their proposals, their plans and, and their sort of aspirations or outcomes. Um, I think there's opportunity for us as combined authorities to embrace the digital perhaps and virtual communities and share some information around this. Um, there's a lot of investment going on. I feel sometimes like I'm speed dating consultants at the moment um, and they're offering you know, the world but they've already often and indeed delivered, perhaps not the world, but you know, they've done a lot of work in Manchester and, and Sheffield and, and the likes. And I think whilst not everything is replicable to different regions, there's still a lot of learning we can draw from that and perhaps we shouldn't all be commissioning consultants um, to do the same work effectively in different areas. Um, and 
I think we probably all echo uh, and the need to look at data and digital, and maybe there's some coordination we could do around that. Great. Um, sorry. Sorry, Rachel. Yeah, did yeah, you I think you've a bit about the regional and local bit. Um, what was the uh, what was the third sector? Was a bit um, the funding the for health and social care. The, ah, yes. Um, yes, I think that's why we're very reserved in the West Midlands about going full throttle <laughs> into the health and social care integration. Great, thank you. Uh, so just a couple of points. On, um, so one, one of this is what's it mean for the local government association. So at the moment we're a, we're a membership-based organisation and individual <coughs> councils are members or, or not. I think this new world is making us think, so what's our offer going to be to combined authorities? So it's not just about local government in their individual capacity. I think we need to be thinking about what's the support we can offer, which takes us straight into that. What's the learning across combined authorities? So that's local areas, uh, rather than sort of relying on Whitehall to do it for us. And just to pick up something that Andy said, some of the local enterprise partnerships have been absolutely brilliant on this agenda. So again, it shouldn't just be seen as a local government agenda or a public sector agenda. Private sector has a lot to contribute here. Um, Bob's question about GO, so uh, once upon a time I was in a government office, government office for the South East as it happens. Uh, that's one of the best three civil service jobs I've ever had. They were super. Uh, but just to give you a sense of how the world has changed. So at their peak there were 3,000 people working in government offices, which was way too many. Uh, as the NAO report uh, said, there are now 155 people in Tom Walker's cities and uh, growth team, plus another seven in the Treasury. So Tom's team does have a significant regional presence, but just to put it in scale, it's 3,000 compared to about 150. Um, the real prize in all of this, going back to something I said earlier around co-production, would be uh, so the goes were really about just checking up on how policies were being implemented. It's to bring that regional knowledge of how, of policy, how policies are implemented earlier on into the policy making process that I think we ought to be pushing for as part of the Devo debate. So rather than policy just being made as it always has in this bit of SW1, how do we use the Devo agenda to get more policy being designed around the country and not just in London. Great, thank you. Um, and just before we wrap up, I'm just going to ask um, each of the three of you to say what one piece of advice you would give um, to an area that doesn't yet have a deal about how to do public service reform within a deal. Rachel. Oh, blimey. On top. Um, <laughs> don't expect to sleep very much. <laughs> it takes a lot of work. <laughs> Great, thank you. Andy? Start small. Yep. Rachel? I'd echo that, but be very resilient and keep pushing the agenda. You know, there's a really strong case there for public service reform. You just need to make politicians and people prick their ears up and listen and take it on board. Great. Well, thank you all very much indeed. Um, thank you for all for coming. Please, can you join me in thanking our fantastic panellists? <laughs>